Well, hello everyone. I'm putting together a, uh, uh, some lecture videos dealing with what is in our textbook the very last of all chapters, and that is therapies. Uh, since we have covered, uh, and if you have not uh, covered material over abnormal behavior, uh, psychopathology, abnormal psych, you probably want to do that before you get into the treatments for abnormal behavior, because that's what we're going to cover in this chapter. Remember that we refer to it, uh, this as psychotherapy, okay? We call this psychotherapy. And to define what it is, like so many things, you really do need to break it down into its most basic terms, uh, and that being Latin. Uh, the simplest way to put it is P-S-Y-C-H-O in Latin means mind, and therapy obviously means treatment. So when you speak of what is called a psychotherapy, what you're simply referring to is a mind treatment. Now, there are a lot of different types of psychotherapy. And before I get into them, I want to take a couple of minutes to tell you a little bit about the history of how psychotherapy has started, where it came from and what it took to get here. I do think it important enough to share that with you. As far as in the past... Um, go back to the Middle Middle Ages, uh, uh, the, the 1500s and stuff like that. If you uh, had the money and uh, you basically uh, uh, had somebody in your family that was showing signs of mental illness, uh, you could have them institutionalized, uh, especially in Europe. You could have them put into what was called an asylum. And a lot of times asylums were, were described as a place where people could get better. Someone will take care of them. Uh, for a certain amount of money, um, you know, you can drop off a, a family member there and go from there. The truth of the matter is that these asylums were horrible places. Uh, the treatment of people within these asylums a lot of times were not therapeutic in any way or shape or form. There was, uh, it was uh, harsh, um, it was damp, people would be uh, uh, walking throughout the uh, uh, asylum or chained to the uh, to their bed or to a chair and, and that it was a terrible place. A gentleman by the name of Philippe Pinel, he really is sort of known as the um, the very first uh, individual who worked to try and make these better places. Uh, became very famous because he basically demanded that the mentally ill be treated with kindness. Uh, he actually, it, it has been said that he actually. Uh, pulled up uh, to uh, one of the asylums there in um, in Paris, France, and uh, went inside and started unchaining some of the people uh, who were there, some call them inmates, and would put them on the back of an ox cart. And to the shock and the dismay of everybody around watching him uh, and uh, some assistants basically uh, take them outside of town, uh, maybe to like a, a sunny hillside on a nice day, and he claimed that they got more out of being out in the fresh air and the sunshine and, and sitting amongst the grass and the flowers and that, you know, feeding them some small amounts. Of, he said they, they gathered more uh, from that in a therapeutic sense than they ever did being in the asylums. So he really is sort of known as the person to get all this started. Another approach to treating uh, people with uh, uh, mental illness is a technique called trifening. It's my understanding that we've seen this actually on more than one continent. We saw this in Central and South America hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Um, I've heard that this was found in tribes elsewhere uh, as well. But if you had a person that was showing signs of mental illness, a lot of times it was believed that they had a, um, you know, basically been invaded by an evil spirit. And the evil spirit was causing them to be doing all of these things. And so trifening was a, a technique to address that. So what is trifening? Well, believe it or not, trifening was an approach where, say, the uh, the council elders or, or the doctor of sorts would turn around and take the, uh, the individual who had evil spirits and literally punch a hole in their skull. I can only imagine what it must have been like to to be held down and and you know by several people while someone is basically trying to punch a hole in the skull of the individual in the name of trying to help them. That's what trifining was. Now, sometimes when that would happen, 
if they punched a hole in the skull and there was, um, say, pressure on the brain, you know, which was causing some of the problems, you would turn around and punch a hole through the skull and you might turn around and hear uh, the sound of the pressure equalizing, sort of like a wisp, you know, as the pressure equalizing. And I guess uh, before several missionaries who observed this uh, hundreds of years ago, you know, council elders and the and the doctor, uh, I really don't want to refer to them as a witch doctor, but maybe that's sort of close to what they were doing. Um, you hear that wisping sound and uh, missionaries reported that they were told that was the uh, evil spirit being uh, let go, was escaping and stuff like that. Now, the question is, did anybody ever really survive this procedure? If you take a moment and pause this tape if you need to, if you take a moment and you look very closely at the skull that I have there, this is an actual skull that had somebody uh, who had went through a trifening procedure. You can see where the original hole was a lot bigger, okay, than what it is. That hole there was closing uh, in the skull. And what that tells you is that in reality, this prob person probably survived. So, there were probably very rare instances that the pressure equalized itself. The, uh, they were no longer in, in tremendous pain from, you know, what they had before. And maybe they got better. Um, it, it was a technique. It really, truly was. Now, the first practical psychologist was good old Sigmund Freud. And uh, Sigmund Freud is someone that, at least in my class, I haven't talked a lot about. Uh, he's just one of many therapists, uh, many psychologists. But now it's his time to shine. Sigmund Freud believed, uh, if you remember from the material in the personality chapter, that a lot of um, issues, personality issues, behavioral issues, and all that came from the unconscious. So if an individual turned around and was suffering from uh, abnormal behavior or uh, mental issues, uh, mental health issues, you had to get into a person's unconscious. That was the key. You had to get into their unconscious. Now, we've passed that. This thing called Freudian psychotherapy, how do we get past the unconscious? Freud believed that the unconscious was sort of like uh, a guard, okay? It was hidden deep within, if you remember the analogy of the of the iceberg, so much of the unconscious is buried deep within. Okay, how do you get into the unconscious? It's very uh, excuse me. It's very well protected. Well, one technique you could use is called free association, and free association was born from the premise and the idea that once in a while, a person's unconscious, which is constantly watching what you say and do sort of missteps, and something is uh, gets out, maybe a true feeling. Um, Freud would have referred to this as a Freudian slip. Let's say you turn around and uh, you're looking at some uh, art uh, that involves uh, some uh, naked people in the picture, okay, and uh, your grandmother is looking at this art that is part of your art class, let's say. And her first run moment, she looks at it. She says, you know, that kind of stuff is really arousing. And she goes, what? What? I mean, really disgusting. Well, she said arousing before she said disgusting. And one could possibly argue that her unconscious slipped for just a second and her true feelings got out. That would be the argument. Well, the uh, and that's sometimes what we call a Freudian slip. The idea behind uh, free association is that you use a technique in olden times where you would ask people to say the very first word that comes to mind. You would say a word to them and they would share the very first word that comes to mind. Um, and the responses would be quick. So if you were to say to them, um, baseball, maybe they would go uh, um, spring sports, I don't know, uh, uh, football. Maybe you turn around and you say uh, uh, football and they go Kansas City Chiefs. And, and, and the idea is that they respond with the very first thing they've got. This, this is free association. Well, the idea is that you would start with maybe three or four or five neutral terms. And then after a while, you would hit them with a, a critical term. So if a client had come to you, you're the therapist, and said that they were having relationship problems with their spouse, marital problems. 
And maybe you start off with this free association technique and you throw out things uh, very neutral at first and you tell them, respond as quickly as you can. And you go sky and they quickly say clouds. And they may ask you, is that what you want? And you say, yes, that's what I want you to do. Let's keep going. And they're like, okay. So you throw out four or five more um, uh, terms. Maybe you say uh, tree and they say oak. And maybe they turn around and say car and you say uh, General Motors. I don't know. And then they finally throw out a critical term, love. And they want you to respond as fast as possible. In so doing, you're hopefully getting past the unconscious which does not have time to screen through possible answers and stuff like that. And you can get to an idea of how they truly feel. Now, once in a while in doing this free association technique, there might be an instance where what happens is that the individual turns around and uh, pauses, hesitates, stutters. Maybe you say to them, uh, caring, and they go, um, um, kindness, they stutter. Now, if you're talking with a friend and they stutter for a moment before saying something, we don't think much of it. But with this, we would analyze their resistance. You might say to them, you know, we're doing a free association technique and I said kindness and you sort of stuttered. Were you going to say something else? And the person may look at you and go, uh, no, uh, you said kindness. And what did I say? I said, uh, I said, caring. That's right. Caring. And you might continue to press them. You know, I think you're about to say something else. Come on now. You want me to help you? They may fight you. No, no, no. I said caring. That's what was on my mind. And you keep pressing them. I'm. You're analyzing their resistance. I think we were about to make a breakthrough and you were going to say something else. What were you going to say initially? And the person may go, okay, well, you said kindness. And the very first thing that came to mind was, was waste, like waste of time. Okay. That's analyzing resistance. You're, you're making inroads and stuff like that. Another way to basically determine what is going on within the unconscious is dream interpretation. This is something I actually talk about in the states of consciousness material there in uh, that chapter on sleep and dreams. And uh, this is where you would actually uh, send a client home to write down their dreams, uh, audio tape them. If they remember them, uh, put them to tape or write them down and uh, don't try to analyze them, but bring them in next week and we'll look them over and uh, see what they what they mean. And the idea is that your dreams are a window to the unconscious in this regard. Two things you need to know are what are called manifest content and latent content. And manifest content simply means uh, this is the actual content of the dream. If you're sitting there right now listening to this and you can remember bits and pieces of a dream you had last night, that, that would be manifest content. Latent content refers to the symbolic message hidden within. What is the message hidden within? Okay, what is the latent image? What is the latent content? And the idea is that to get into the unconscious, we would look at what your dreams are all about, but we would look at the latent message hidden in within. In fact, Freud turned around and had, uh, you know, uh, a book known as the interpretation of dreams that he had at one time because he thought it meant so much. It really, truly did in that regard. OK, that's a good start. Uh, what psych, uh, psychotherapy is a little bit of its history, and the discussions of the very first individual. I think we'll stop right there. I'll have more uh, lecture videos for you to get into some of the other content. Take care.